It is a scam when you don't allow everyone to operate on fair terms. We are the Robin Hoods of sports betting. We take something back from the rich bookies and enable our customers to beat them instead. Hi guys, Alex here. Welcome to the Trade Mate Sports Betting Podcast. Today, as you'll see, I'm joined by two guests on the podcast, which should be plenty of fun. You'll be quite familiar with the man at the top right of your screen, CEO of Trade Mate Sports, Marius Norheim. Welcome back to the podcast, mate. Pleasure to be on, Alex. It's been a while, so it's good, good to be back. Yeah, now there is a reason why you're on the podcast today, and we can get to that briefly in a second but you'll see down the bottom of the screen my second guest today this will take a while to go through all the many talents of this man he is a professor of applied mathematics at the university of Uppsala in sweden he has completed his doctorate in mathematics the author author of many books and written for the likes of the economist the telegraph 442 magazine and much much more He's also made various sports betting models and is currently working at Hammerby football team in Sweden in data analytics. Welcome to the podcast, David. I probably missed a few things there. (laughs) Oh, no, that's very good. Thank you. Thank you. It's great to be here. Great to see Marius again. Yeah, no, awesome stuff. And and the reason we have got Marius on the podcast too is because you and Marius and also Jan, who's a developer at TradeMate, you guys have all done work together in recent years and we can get to that later in the podcast. But I think it'd be great to just start with you, David, since you're new to the to the podcast and introduce yourself. Tell us a bit about your, you know, your mass background and and I guess how it can be applied to sports and betting and all these kind of things. A very overall question for you to start. Yeah, with. I mean, my background really is I'm an academic and I've always been interested in research questions like how do we use maths to understand the world? And that, um, I think from the start, I was interested in how we could use maths to model human behavior. But I found when I started working on this, it was a lot easier to look at animal behavior. So I worked a lot on fish and uh, birds and ants and honeybees. I actually wrote my thesis about honeybees. And then I gradually uh, I just solved a lot of problems in there. I moved around the world. It's a great job to have. You get to go to lots of places. I've been to Sydney a couple of times, actually, and uh, traveled around a lot of lot of the world solving math problems related to things. And then I wrote the book Soccermatics, and um, I had a sort of amateur interest in football up to then. But writing the book got me deeper and deeper into it. And part of Soccermatics was about betting as well. So I started developing a few betting models and tried out different approaches to them. And that's, I think, why Marius and Jan got in contact with me to start with. And then they, we started working on a few models together and I actually learned a lot from them and they hopefully learned a bit from me. And uh, that's, yeah, that's how I've, I've ended up here. So it's kind of like very tortured, lots of different things along the way. I'm, I, I wouldn't say I'm like primarily like a mathematician. I'm absolutely not. I, or I'm not even like a football mathematician. I'm a mathematician who just loves to apply his trade in lots of different places and um, that's what I get my real enjoyment from. Yeah, sorry, I, th- I think we might be on a little bit of a lag here, we'll keep going. Uh, okay. <laughs> so can you can you understand a little bit like how, how mathematics can help improve our understanding of football and then like how that can be applied to the to the betting side of stuff? Yeah, I think uh, so betting is a small part of how we can use maths to understand football. So when I work with Hammerby, for example, that's mainly on the spatial patterns of football. So it's the organization of the formations, how we can improve tactically. It's also scouting, how we can find the best players to sign and how we can evaluate the players that we've got just now. And then with betting, it's actually a different set of models that you don't really use the types of models you use to understand the game. I, I, I make this, this point a few times in the book that um, you can actually understand, you can actually win money betting with zero understanding of football. I think it's fair to say that Jan doesn't have very much understanding of football, if I, if I remember rightly. So pe- various people who work in the bindus- betting industry can actually have zero understanding of the game and still 
uh, manage to make money from from finding an edge. So it's not necessarily the case that there's the best approach to football modeling is to put all of your knowledge of football into it. Um, it might be one of the approaches, but that's not necessarily the best approach. Yeah, yeah. I think at least at, uh, at TradeMate, I was the first person to work here who was actually interested in football. And I guess okay. I was like the, <laughs> the, the fourth, fourth person or something like that to join. So uh, luckily I, I managed to get in Alex and uh, he's also interested in it. So that uh, then it became a bit more fun during the lunch talks. <laughs> 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 I mean, I, I think the thing is, the thing is regarding the um, interest and the use of football is the reason I was so interested in working with you guys when you first contacted me is you had access to odds. And what I realized in writing Socomatics, I found there's lots of interest in maths in, in football, but the betting part of it, it's the odds which are the key. When you actually have access to the odds, um, then you you can start to open up things. and. I went in the 10 equations. I wrote actually about um, William Bedner, who's one of the pioneers of, of statistical betting and his work. And for him, it was this aha, um, ex like that's that was the, the key when he realized that what he needed to do was go into the, the, um, uh, the whether it was the jockey club. When he went into the jockey club and he found the record of all of the odds that had been um, yeah. collected over the years, then he could crack the key to betting. So he obviously had all other data understanding of things about the horses, but really cracking the key was cracking the code was having access to the odds. Yeah, I mean, something we see with uh, TradeMate as well, and that I think the majority of like people who just watch football and play some bets for fun don't realize is is just just what you mentioned like how important mm. the odds is whether you are getting like 290 or 280 or 270 on a bet makes a huge difference in terms of whether you can expect that to be uh, a profitable bet in the long run and mm. it, it really isn't about uh about like predicting which of the teams is going to win it's about finding those spots where one of the team is slightly undervalued uh, compared to like the true odds. Uh, so uh, yeah, I, I very no, much I, agree I, with that. I think that's absolutely correct. And, and it's kind of, and I'm, I mean, I introduce this in the book as well. I talk about, and it's kind of sad, actually. I mean, I, I during when I gave, some, I gave some betting tips for CBS before, and I got so many emails about like, what's the tip? for Saturday's match or Thursday's match or something like that, as if I could give a tip on a win or lose. Yeah, so I can't, I can't give a, a tip of that type that some team is definitely going to win. It's just a 0.5% um, advantage that you have. And that means that, well, 49.95% of the time, you're actually going to lose that bet that I give the tip on. And I think that's really the difficulty with, with that that type of thinking that you have to get over the idea that you have to understand football. What you need to do is understand how to get an advantage over the odds. Yeah, it's so true. And it's also like a common question that we get uh, at TradeMate, like what's your win percentage? How, how many of mm -hmm. your bets are, are winning bets? And I'm like, that really depends on what your average odds is. If you are betting with an average odds of 2.0, then you should expect to win 50% of your bets. And uh, if that then is slightly higher than what the true odds of the game is, then you should expect to yeah, uh, win, win a bit more. So it's, uh, yeah. it's, it's really funny just uh, how, how people don't, don't realize that. But it's such a, a key thing to know and understand if you mm -hmm. are going to uh, be doing betting. Uh, for anything. No, I think, I mean, and I think it's fair enough because even as a maths professor, I didn't understand this at first. So when I wrote Socomatics, I set up four different models. I set up a model based on ELO rankings, a model based on expected goals, and um, I can't remember. Oh, yes, one of the models was I just asked my wife some if she could make some picks. She says they weren't random. And then the other one is that I, I just looked at this these odds biases. 
And I found it was the odds biases that consistently made money. Actually, there is this still debate in our household because my wife also made money when she was betting. <laughs> and so it's kind of, but she placed a lot less bets than I did. And she then she said, you know, I'm ahead, I'm going to quit. She sort of said, this was the last weekend. She threw everything on. I think Crystal Palace beat Manchester United. This was 2016 and she got a big payout on that. And she said, right, I'm going to quit when I was ahead. And she was right to do that. She made a little bit of money <laughs> with her betting. She claims she has a system, but um, I'm not sure <laughs> she really does. <laughs> Oh, well, that's that's what you should do if you're not sure whether or not you have an edge. Then you should definitely stop when uh, when you're ahead <laughs> instead of uh, running into the good old like gambler traps. Yeah. How how have your models changed over the years, David? Because I guess like in recent years, I'm not sure exactly when it all kind of boomed, but there was like the underlying data boom and like you know stuff like XG and all this stuff like started coming out and. Mm -hmm. bookmakers are factoring all of this into their own models so it's almost impossible to have an edge with this kind mm -hmm. of data like was there ever a point where you realized oh no like my model or my models are almost like break even now because i'm producing the exact same odds as the as the bookmakers yeah, so the, the Premier League model, which I first made in Soccermatics, that started to lose money about two years ago. And it made money, it made it grew by something like 2000%, I think, during from the time I made it. But why it started to lose money is not exactly clear to me because the odds didn't change that much. I don't think it was too much of the bookmakers adjusting the odds in response to that. So I think that was just a... Um, a time period where it was statistically significant, it worked out for a while. And so what you have to do is you have to keep reassessing these types of models. If you have a particular model that's based on an assumption, you have to keep reassessing them. And this was something we talked about a lot, um, Jana, Marius and I, was that I believe that you want to have models for particular leagues and for particular ways in which people think about those leagues. So I was very interested, and that's what we worked on, was a model for the World Cup. Because my feeling about the World Cup is that what happens is you get a lot of amateurs coming in and just throwing very kind of random money at it. And we actually found that. So we found that the bookmakers odds, um, the bookmakers odds that were set in January for the World Cup in June were more accurate than the odds just before the match which is just kind of crazy but yeah. it's because the bookmakers bookmakers are attractive to all the crazy people who are coming in and play they there was actually a sort of edge to be gotten there just by taking the original odds which were incredibly clever bookmakers with all their fancy models which were reasonably correct so you took them and then you applied them on the bookmakers themselves when you got closer to the tournament and that was i mean I always have to emphasize these things that that was a, a small scale experiment. There isn't enough matches in the World Cup to be sure. Actually, you've never you've never given me the money we made on this, Marius. You actually owe me some money, but we made some money on that uh, on that tournament. Yeah, we will you've get that settled immediately after this <laughs> with, with interest. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I'll interrupt no. there because th I heard this. I heard this little story about how, when you first met you two, that uh, Marius didn't even want to pay you for Soccermatics, mate. You had to send him a coffee for free. <laughs> he's asking, he's he asking for all no. this mathematical genius, and he's not even going to go buy a book of the, the co copy of the book. Yeah, but I think, I mean, you know, that I understand. I mean, respect to that. That that means that that's somebody who's always looking for that edge, you know. Can I find an edge over David and get his book for free? And so he's always looking for it. So, um, was, you know, yeah, okay, it was a bit stingy. I can't remember who bought the beer, <laughs> either, to be honest. <laughs> I think I bought the drink. <laughs> Uh, yeah, David was a very pleasant host when we came and visited him in Sweden, so <laughs> that was much appreciated for sure. And uh, we, of course, always uh, settle our debts here at uh, <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I know. I just, haven't, I haven't just, uh, just like the Lannisters, that's the, uh, <laughs> that's the people I like to emulate. <laughs> but I think for me, it was it was very interesting to have them visit because, um, in the 10 equations, what I got at. When when they first visited, 
it, so in the 10 equations it's the first chapter of the book is about Jan and Marius's visit and I was still kind of formulating what this book would be about I actually envisaged maybe I would write a pure betting book and the book I ended up writing was more about how maths is used to get this edge in all different ways and so it was kind of inspiring for me to see these two young guys who came and wanted to learn a bit of maths in order to get an edge over the bookmakers and start up a business but when i started researching and doing more for the book i found that it's this same principle is in financial markets it's the same idea it's the same idea really in football clubs you're looking for an edge in a slightly different way and it's the same same principle in um, social media and so on that these google employ a lot of mathematicians so it's really about taking that mathematical knowledge and sort of finding a way that you can get a little bit bit of an advantage over everyone else yeah yeah definitely there was one uh, one point uh, with regards to like uh, when you talked about the premier league model and how things have changed like over the last two years i mean one of the really key things that we've seen with trademate over five plus years now is just how important it is to have like a big sample size of bets Mm -hmm. um, because swing, swings, even when you have like uh, a, a clear edge, like we do with TradeMate, our, our customers have like a 2.65% ROI per bet over three and a half million bets. But even mm -hmm. even when you have that 2.65% edge, there, there can still be like thousands of bets uh, where you're not winning, uh, even mm -hmm. though you're following a profitable strategy, uh, because we have the data that's showing that over such a huge sample size. Um, so it is totally within the normal uh, range that uh, that those Premier League bets can not be profitable for two years, for example. Like that, mm. that wouldn't surprise me at all. And at the at the same time, it's also important to uh, to make sure that uh, the period they were profitable that that wasn't just based on <laughs> exactly <random> bets, <laughs> but on, on actual edge. So it, it kind of cuts both ways. Uh, exactly. I mean, I think you're right to be cautious um in that way that you do have to establish these things over and i remember i sent a model to um to Leon and to Jan and he sent it back with all this that he looked at exactly this and there wasn't an edge over longer enough periods there is something i have to actually follow up on this and uh and look at it again but you I, i've noticed this that you're very careful of having these kind of patterns over long periods i think as a professional gambler, I can imagine that that is very, very nerve wracking because if you see a five year period where you're winning, then you enter a two year period where you're losing, then what, which of those periods was the correct period? It's still very difficult. If you've got a five year, five year winning streak and then you, and it looks very good. And then you go into a two year downslide, then it's very difficult to know which of those was the correct, the correct underlying model. Um, yeah, that's, that's the challenge. Well, that's not the challenge because <laughs> it's funny to say it's a challenge. I mean, that's where it becomes very nerve wracking, I suppose. That's where you have to know that you're in different markets as well, that you have a sort of balance of these different different approaches. Yeah, I mean, one, one just needs to like first the overall like strategy or method one is following needs to make fundamentally sense. And then you need mm. to have the data to back it up. And if both of those still hold true, um and you like there are ways you can measure it like with trade mate we for example uh, when betting on pre-game we measure the odds we are betting on versus the odds at the time the game starts and then we use that mm. as a benchmark to determine whether or not this was a good bet or a bad bet whether the bet had like a mm. positive expected value uh, so there are other ways in which you can like objectively uh, measure uh, whether or not what you're doing is something that is going to work out in the long run Hmm. So, so with your World Cup model, you were obviously before. I'm assuming it was the 2018 World Cup. You'd gone yeah. back and you'd researched the 2014, 2008, all the oh, sorry, 2010, all the like previous World Cups, and you'd and you'd seen something in the data that showed that the opening odds were more more accurate reflection of predicting the outcome of the game than the closing odds, which represented, I guess. Uh, what would you call a recreational money that have come into the that's come into the market and and steered the odds in the wrong mm. direction or a less predictable direction? Yeah, that was part of it. And again, you've got a very small sample size. What I mean by that is you've got a very small number of observations because you've just got World Cups. 
And then we looked at like qualifying games, but it's not the same thing because qualifying games can be very uneven. It's a very different type of thing. It's not at the tournament. So we, I think we used Euro as well. So we th thought like, what, like, let's do a study of just the odds at these big games. And actually, if you put up my, I mean, I had the, I had a few slides which illustrate what you're what you're saying yeah. there. Part of it, part of it was definitely the um, the bias that I mentioned before and afterwards. But if you go down to slide um, fourteen, it's a few. This is from my talk at the Royal Institution where I go through a few ba betting basics. But what is plotted here? And yeah, I've got Marius and Jan here. What's plotted here um, is, uh, oh, sorry, <laughs> yeah, that's all right. What's plotted here in this straight line is on the on the x-axis is the bookmakers' odds, and they're in British notation here. So got two to one, evens, one to three, one to ten, which is a, a big favourite. And then on the left hand side, you've got the frequency of wins in terms of a probability. And that equation there, P equals one over one plus X, um, that equation just says that if, if the odds are fair, then um, the, if X is the odds, then the probability of the team winning is that. So that's one of the most basic equations of betting. If you have fair odds of X, then the probability of the team winning, according to the bookmakers, is one over one plus x. If those are European odds, yeah, make sure you don't make this mistake. If those are European odds, then it's just one over the odds because you always add one for the European odds compared to the, the British odds, uh, the way they're done in the UK. So, okay, so that line that's plotted there, that's what a fair bet is. And so if you scroll down to the next slide, yeah, that's the one. So then, this isn't the real data, but this is like some data that you might get in that looks like this. I made the data for illustrative purposes. This is the sort of way that your data might look when you plot those bookmakers odds versus the frequency of wins. And there I've got all the, um, the odds there that was downloaded. And so you've got those dots and you've got your line. And if you go down to the next one, what I do is I put the line through the dots. Yeah. So th this one, for example, so this is, this is a very typical, um what's called long shot bias so bookmakers odds slightly underestimate favors with shorter odds so when a team has very very short odds it's actually slightly more likely to win than is predicted by the model and then if you go down one more slide you also have this other effect and this is a kind of this is a subtle thing here that it overestimates favorites with longer odds so if you have a favorite that has quite long odds, one to one or two to one, then those teams tend to be overestimated. One example of this from the World Cup 2014 was England versus Uruguay. England were a, a weak favorite for that game, but they lost it. And that, te that tended to be something that happened in these big matches. Um, and so what you can then do, and that's where the mathematical modeling kite came, comes in. If you go down one more slide, yeah. um, then this was the equation we fitted to the data. And that's what I call the betting equation. It's one of the 10 equations that rule the world. And it says, well, OK, when we had alpha equal to one and beta equal to one, we had the probability of the favorite wins of one over one plus X. But if we can find the alpha and the beta, which more closely match the bookmaker's odds. So if you go down one, one more slide, and we estimated them to be 1.16 for the alpha and, and 1.25 for the beta. So this, of course, you have to do in a, it's using a technique called logistic regression. So you have to program this. You can actually get a line that goes closer to the odds. And it was that equation that we then used to decide if we should place a bet or not. If we could get odds that were closer to the prediction here than the original um, odds, then it was worth worth placing a bet. So it's a, a case of actually, and this is why I say there's no, there's no footballing knowledge involved in this. This is just a case of finding a bias in the odds and finding a model which matches that, matches that bias. It definitely is, I, I mean, I, I think 
it's not true to say that you can never use football model football information in this. You can put things like expected goals into these models and various other things and get better fits to the data. But overall, the, the basic idea is is just to or the basic starting point is always with the odds. So if we so if we had to summarize this in the most like easiest uh, digestible fashion as possible for people who might be mm. confused about mathematics. Yeah, like that, you, that's what I thought I'd just done. But, yeah. Uh, okay. No, no, no. Just, no, like, I'm just going to make it really, really dumb, no, really, really dumb for the betting minds out there like me that are really slow yeah, and bad at mathematics. You're basically, you throughout all your modeling and all that kind of stuff, you were able to figure out that. Uh, if let's just say the odds were at like 1.2 or 1.3 for a team to win, there was absolutely no value in those, but there was value in favourites, let's just say bigger odds like a 1.8 or a 1.9, something like that. Um, actually, there was value There was value in backing favourites when they were 1.05 and 1.1, which is is often the case the boring bet that no one wants to make is the value <laughs> bet and so you know backing in in that particular case for the world cup backing the 1.05 odds which is one in one in ten right. one over ten in, in yeah. british odds um that's the one to go for but there was also value there so there was value in backing the non-favorite in even matches and so if um, if you had, yeah, the, the example I gave was England versus Uruguay. England are the favorites. Uruguay are slightly, they are a strong team, but they're not the favorites. Then it's, then you can place your money on Uruguay and you'll have an advantage. So that's what, yeah. that's what the odds said last, last World Cup. And actually it worked in last World Cup. So there is a reasonable chance that it, it has some possibility of, of uh, working in the coming Euros, for example, in the coming World Cup. We'll see. Yeah, no, it's it's really interesting. I guess I just got it around the wrong way. So you were you both working together on this model and, and both betting together or was it just one of you or, yeah, tell me that situation. Um, yeah, so then we just, uh, th this was when these guys were really just starting up and, uh, placed half and half bet. actually i mean the thing is called the risk because i it but uh we just agreed that with those bets and then we agreed we'd, we'd uh split the profits on on that one um i mean in the end i wrote a book out of it and i'm not giving i'm not going to hand over especially not to yarn i'm not going to hand in it over any of the royalties of the book so uh, <laughs> i have nothing to complain about but the so, um so we had uh, we had one tenth of the chapters right so that's one tenth of the <laughs> no, no way <laughs> Actually, I have to say, I still haven't sent you that free copy. I promised to send. I, sent you a PDF. <laughs> I, haven't, I haven't sent the. Uh... <laughs> so mm. I'm thinking in a yarn type of way here. <laughs> yeah. So so Marius and Marius and yeah, you you guys used this model. Then um, can you kind of explain like how successful it was? Um, and also, I think it's. I think I think they used a slightly different model. In the end, it was a different model that you used in the season because if i remember rightly you were looking for these uh, you were looking directly at the odds weren't you for over and under bets anyway they, you you can explain it better than i i can yeah so it was the honor was the main guy with the modeling uh so mm. <laughs> I, I can't say that i remember too well the details about exactly what we did there um but yeah i remember that the world cup bets were profitable and that was pretty cool to see after yeah mm. doing it but so you were so were you applying some of the things that David's pointed out here? So like you know, seeing value in really short favourites. Yeah, so we were testing out uh, testing out things like that, and I mean the favourite long shot bias is one thing that we are adjusting for within TradeMet, and that was something that we started do doing several years ago after we we noticed that there was a. An unexplained difference between um, the odds at the time uh, one placed the bet versus um, the odds at the time the game started. Like the difference between, if you were thinking inside Trey and Alex, the difference between the uh, the edge placed versus the closing edge. Because uh, in theory, like a game should be 50 50, just as likely to increase versus decrease in odds before the game started. 
Yeah. Uh, so we, we made an adjustment for that and that improved the results, but it didn't fully explain like the whole difference. And that is actually part that we still haven't uh, figured out exactly why that is. Uh, so until we come up with a better explanation, we just accept that it is always going to be um, the closing edge is always going to be a bit lower than what the edge placed was. And what's that like when you see when you see value in something that's one point one or you know I think David you even said one point zero five, like how it kind of it goes against like every gambler's mindset, doesn't it? Because the gambler <laughs> the gambler wants to bet on the biggest odds possible. Um, even you know, even like you said, with the the overestimating the the favourites with the longer odds, like a one point eight or something like that. Like one point eight's a lot nicer to be betting on from a gambler's perspective than one point zero five. Like, can you talk me through like your mentality, like uh, Marius, in terms of like like how you overcome that, like I guess like gambler's bias or whatever you want to call it. Yeah, so I think this is actually quite funny because we constantly have like customers writing us in our, our support and also on like the Facebook group and stuff we have saying that they're not betting on very, very short odds. And to me, this this doesn't make any any sense uh, because as, as David like saw in his models, like uh, the favorites are often uh, undervalued. So it's usually good to be betting on them. Of course, we are adjusting for this inside trade mate, so um, it is kind of factor into the model uh, that you are seeing. Uh, but still, like setting a, a minimum cap on 1.5 in odds, for example, like I, I would never do that, and I don't do that. Um, but I think why people do it has a lot to do uh, with psychological biases that humans have. Uh, we hate losing, and we remember our losses so much more strongly than what we do our wins. So I think that one time you place a really big bet on 1.01 and all of a sudden it loses, you're going to remember that for the rest of your life. Uh, and then people don't do it again, even though they would have been yeah, profitable 99.9% .9 of the time, and they should be taking that bet. Um, so the, the thing that I would do there is that I would always take the bet, but if you think that the risk is too high, like you don't want to stake like... 10,000 kroners to win like 10 kroners, uh, then just reduce the stake to a level that one is comfortable with. But I would still take the bet uh, because an edge is an edge and um, bets with lower odds have a higher probability of winning. So you, you will win more more often than not. I mean, I think there is there's also the, the question of like why you're betting in the first place. I think if you're if you're just going to place a few bets, then actually it doesn't make sense to take a 1.05 bet because if you're just sitting there clicking on like lots of 1.05 bets and maybe if you're only going to place like 10 bets a week then yeah there's no point in doing that because you're you're going to make a very steady but small profit but it's kind of boring and um i think it really depends on why you're doing it in the first place and i think that's the what you're you're manipulating actually when you are creating a trading system which is placing those bets because then you place those bets and you you take in the money or if you're really into it and you're going to click on a lot of bets then you're taking the advantage over all the people who can't be bothered um clicking on those bets and taking in the small payments yeah i, I think what you what you say makes sense i mean I think that's also a big reason why accumulators are so uh, popular mm -hmm. with bookmakers and yeah. also why, why you see like the bookmakers promoting it so much and people loving it. Um, mm. What most people don't realize with them is that if you don't have an edge when you're betting and you do an accumulator, the house's edge against you increases even further. Uh, yeah. but the, the same thing, uh, same thing works the other way. If you have the edge, then your edge would get bigger. It's just that the variance also increases. So it's a bit of a, a trade-off there. And uh, as we talked yeah, about earlier, you... since, uh, sample size is so important, increasing the variance uh, is, is not something I like to do, at least. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't think people often don't realize how much, how bad a bet an accumulator is, because if the bookmakers have a 5% odds on you, then 
you basically have you do naught point the first bet you have naught point nine five then you multiply again and you go down to naught point nine one then you're going down very rapidly towards zero um, expected profit so it's like an exponential decay we all know about exponential growth because of the coronavirus exponential decay is the opposite and it goes down equally fast as exponential growth goes up and exponential decay is what happens whenever you put anything on a on an accumulator which the bookmakers know is going to be a good accumulator for their part yeah so there we have it from the maths professor don't do access, <laughs> uh, <people. laughs> um i think we've, we've gone a little bit into what you guys have done together already but if we can kind of take a step back david and can you just mm. give like a general overview of like when you're when you're sitting down to create a model or something like that can you take us from the like the from day one to day 100 or 300 whatever however long it takes you to refine and test and all these kind of things like um and kind of some of the challenges with creating a model too like just so mm. there are people out there who are thinking, oh, I'd love to model basketball, I'd love to model ice hockey, all these kind of things, like mm. how, like what that whole process is like. Yeah, that's a really good question because there's lots of different types of models. And I think the best way of thinking about it first is, and I think this, this comes from, well, for me, I mean, I grew up like, uh, in the uh, I grew up in the 1980s or I was born in the 1970s and I grew up having a little computer which you could write programs on and get to do things and so the best idea of think I think for thinking about a model is writing a computer program that simulates some part of life and that's when I got all interested in honeybees you know I'm simulating how honeybees move and fly around and talk to each other so the first thing to think about is really like one of those games like um, Sims or something like that, that what you're trying to do is simulate some aspect of life. And then, then you, when you start to think about it like that, then you think, well, there's all these sort of, that's really complicated. If I made a Sims model of basketball and uh, or a Sims model of football, that's just too complicated. I have to place bets on the outcome of that because of lots of things I can't measure and I do it down. And that's the process that happened in me in learning about modeling is I went from these more complicated ideas of simulating to finding out what is the underlying dynamics. And the underlying dynamics is often encoded in maths. So a good example I often use is this Poisson distribution, which is the distribution of when things happen totally at random. And so if you have three goals on average in a football match, for example, the Poisson distribution will go up and then it will come down and it will describe how many goals you expect to occur in a particular match. And that's a starting point for a, a model of gambling. So it's really, it's about, first of all, it's like thinking of everything that's important. Then it's trying to boil it down to the essentials. And those essentials happen to be captured in these types of mathematical curves. And you'd, you'd, there is actually no, there's no way of, if you want to do, betting in the way that i'm talking about there's no way of completely avoiding learning the maths you can do different types of models you can do simpler models more complicated models but you have to learn some of the mathematical notation and the mathematical methods before you can you can make any progress how hard would it be for someone like me who's not great at mathematics and has never done any like modeling or work in like i hear about these softwares called python and all these kind of like <laughs> how hard is it for someone like me like how long do you think the learning curve would be for me to create anything close to a model that you can create well you're young and uh, <laughs> i think that <laughs> i think you know there's always there's two parts to the answer i mean anyone can do it right so there's no there's no kind of exclusion that you have to be particularly smart so um like everyone i mean my son's just got into sp playing chess and i'm useless at chess and i'm useless at those types of things so i'm and i'm like not a math genius in in the way that i can solve these like really important problems so anybody can learn these types of techniques and it's really just to sit down and start i mean this is a good good place for me to sell the uh the course we did, we did an online course on YouTube, sell it. We don't need to sell it. We gave it away for free 
So yeah, now, now I'm going to make another yarn joke. Yarn is just going to get yarn. There's a free course. You should go and look at it. Um, <laughs> uh, I will send the, the link after this. <laughs> um, so basically it's there. We try and start from the basics. In fact, you were mentioning Python in the course. The first lecture I do is I show you how to download Python, install it on your computer. <laughs> And write the hello world program, and we do have quite a big step up. I don't. I don't think if you've never done anything like this before, I don't think that you could just take that course and go all the way up to the top level. There's programming bits to learn in between, but but we we created that thing. This was something I did together with um, some analysts who work at Barcelona, Benfica, England, Germany, and and one at Hammerby as well. We basically sat down and said, "Well, what what do we know?" And we just made some YouTube videos explaining it all, and that was that was very successful. So I, I think you know it's for anybody this type of stuff. But and so that's the side that's the side where I say it's for anybody. But you also said you know, but it's for anybody who really wants to and is really interested enough to spend the time doing it. So I do think it's for anybody, but you do have to put the hours in. Uh, I got a couple of things to add to that, and because like I started learning some Python on my free time a couple of years ago, um, like right right now I have like a project of making my own fantasy football model, for example. Cool. And I, I always think one, it's good to have a project, something specific that mm. you want to get out of it. Um, two, both maths and Python, they're they're just languages. So just like you can learn to understand English or Norwegian or Swedish or Australian, if that's uh, <laughs> with Alex, um, it's um, like you need to you need to just become familiar with like the the terminology and everything, and then it's it's kind of similar to languages in that there are some things you use a lot, and those you get really mm. good at and proficient at, and then there are some things you can't really be bothered to remember, but those you can always Google or look up. Uh, so I've spent a lot of time googling uh, things. Uh, which I didn't uh, remember from from doing it in the past, or which I didn't know from already. And usually, someone has already solved the problem before, and then you just mm. need to yeah understand the language and then be able to apply that to your own specific use case. And when just looking at like the Poisson distribution, like reading through it on a like a maths paper, uh, it seems pretty complicated. But uh, when you like boil it down in terms of implementation. It usually that often isn't that hard because it's like you need to have some inputs and then you sort of have the formula which you just write out the same way it's, it's mm -hmm. kind of written and then you get the outputs and doing that in a program or in Excel usually isn't uh, isn't too difficult so at least getting started it can look pretty intimidating um, but it, it mm -hmm. is totally possible for uh, for anyone really to uh, to give it a shot and probably yeah be able to uh, to surprise themselves with what they can do yeah i mean i i agree it's 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 something like think of a fun thing you'd like to do and sit down and do it um do it in the evening so i, I again i mentioned my son he's now playing drums downstairs if you can hear any banging but um i mean i he wanted to learn programming and that's what i found is that it worked best for him if it was something he wanted to do so for example he sometimes he does these typing tests, like how fast you can type. And then he found a program where you could automatically get your keyboard to type as fast as you wanted without you having to type yourself. So you could cheat in typing tests, online typing tests and get the high score. And <laughs> that was very motivating for him. He could he could do things like that. And I think that's that's the way to to do it. And that's always why I've been motivated. But I've just found a problem that I'm motivated in. And then I thought how I can use um, how I can use modeling and mathematics to solve it. Yeah, no, it's very interesting that I could have used one of those cheating typing things back in my day when I was at school. I was always a very and still am a very, very, very slow typer. Um, I wanna I wanna go like okay, so you've why did you go to Sweden in the first place, Murray? It's like, what interested you about David, and like, why, like, why in general did you want to go out there with Jan? Yeah, so I mean, we had our background from TradeMate. We've been working with odds and with betting for a while, so we felt we had like pretty strong knowledge about that part. But none of us are mathematicians, so we were like, okay, maybe there's something that uh, we are missing out on here. And I remember like long long time ago i saw some uh 
uh, some articles that David wrote for a bookmaker about expected goals. And I thought, hmm, here's a maths professor that uh, has been doing some stuff with betting. And maybe I just try sending him an email and see if he wants to talk with us. Uh, so I think we uh, we started out with having a call via Skype, and then at some point, uh, I can't remember if David invited us over or uh, if we invited ourselves over or what happened, but uh, <laughs> we ended up going, and it was, uh, was a lot of fun sitting there uh, working on like making models and then watching the games on the TV in the evening uh, yeah. after like, playing bets on them. So it was a very, very fun experience. No, that that was it was it was interesting to have you. I mean, I think, and again, I mean, I get loads and loads of emails, sometimes asking for tips, sometimes asking for um, general advice. But you wrote a very clear email, like saying what you wanted to do, and you showed that you already had done a lot of research and talked to a lot of people. So I was very impressed with that email, and that's why I answered it and got in touch with you because, well, both both because I thought it would be interesting to work with someone who was really going to do this properly um but also just because you wrote a very clear idea of what you and this is maybe some advice for i do get i still get a lot of emails from people and i love getting emails from people who are interested in this kind of thing but at the same time i don't like getting messages saying can we just have a random skype meeting or something that i'm going to sit there and talk to people about the very basics because i think it's it really is a case you can do a bit of research yourself and then you can start to ask more informed questions, uh, um, I think. That's, that's why we've made some videos to, to look at to get those sorts of basics. But really, it's it, um, it, to impress, and it's probably the same if you write an, an email to Marius now and want to get a job for a trade mate, <laughs> is that you have to impress with the basic skills first, and then you can take the next step. I don't know if you're recruiting yeah. yet. <laughs> yeah, if uh, if people don't know what one x two is, then we have a problem. So uh, <laughs> you gotta you gotta know the basics first. That's important in any life situation. <laughs> mate, uh, even I didn't know what a one x two was when we when I first started working at Trade, mate. <laughs> oh, really? You you just, lured your way into the company despite that? I know. We just back yeah, here. We one just X, call it windrow. One x two. <laughs> I think one x two is like a Scandinavian thing. I'm not yeah, sure that it's. It I think it's. Uh, yeah, just call it the wind draw win. Make it simple. <laughs> uh, isn't, isn't it yeah. <laughs> it's uh, it's at least uh, what most of the bookmakers use as uh, notation okay. in uh, okay. in like their um, what do you call it? Uh, their yeah APIs and everything like that. Like okay. it's so it's always the one. That's because it's Scandinavians who program all their APIs. That's why. <laughs> That wouldn't surprise me. I mean, uh, <laughs> when I've, I've been to a couple of uh, conferences within the industry and like wherever I go, it's like Norwegians, Danes and Swedes uh, talking around me and a couple of Finns. So, yeah, <laughs> really is a, a Scandinavian industry. So you've obviously gone in and you've looked at it from a more league perspective. Like, do you think, do you think uh sports betters and maybe this is a better question for you david like do you think people can then like refine it even further and try and find biases in like a team like arsenal or southampton or brighton like go and look at these like actual like teams i know the the sample size is going to be you know horrendous it's going to be very very I small think the, i think the refining that's being done or will be i mean certainly the big bookmakers are doing this already is in the live betting and um we this is where i think possibly some of the the work that we do so i also run this company 12 and what we do you can actually download the 12 app and what what it does is it evaluates every action that the players do live during the match and that type of idea that you can actually put values on on the actions of the players and then maybe you can learn from those who's been performing best you can learn whether they're more likely to score a goal. Or I might suspect that the player who actually has a lot of the ball and um, has a lot of the passing and maybe has had a few shots, they're probably the player that everyone else is betting on to score. So you actually bet in the opposite direction. Which way those bets are going to go, you don't know until you've done the statistical model. There's no point sort of speculating until you've done the statistical model. But what you can do is you can fit a statistical model which uses the actions of the players on the pitch 
to predict different types of outcomes later in the game, or more importantly, just how people are betting on the basis of those outcomes. And I, I imagine there are lots of people who, when a, um, when a player has a lot of the ball and seems to be dominating in some way, I bet there's quite a lot of money that goes on that player to score. Probably the smart move is not to go with that player. But but we'd see. We'd have to do the statistics first to work out. But that's that's where I see um, some future edges coming up is in the live betting. When a goal mm. is scored, the odds uh, change a lot. You can probably be smarter about how uh, you bet exactly after after the, the goal has gone in. I uh, read an article um, about how Liverpool went about their uh, their analytics, and apparently they had this like pressure chart, and uh, where they were like looking at the players' positions and at any given point mm. in time, calculating the probability of the team scoring. Is that similar mm. similar approach to what you guys have been doing? Yeah, exactly. With, uh, we call it analytics? expected. I mean, it has a few different names. We call it like expected possession value. So it's 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 like an actually an extension of expected goals idea, but you. You do it on every action that the players perform, and you can look statistically over earlier games um, how much a particular pass contributed. I, 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 don't, I go into this quite a lot in the ten equations, also. So, how much a pass contributed to the team, and then you can actually value that based on how often it, how much it contributed earlier. You build up a statistical model, and, and that's what Liverpool use in scouting, for example and all the big clubs using scouting now how much value does the actions of the players add to their add to the team as a whole mm, that's really interesting so like if if i'm you know coming up and maybe wanting to create a model and uh yeah you so marius and yeah i'm looking at like particular leagues and i mentioned like you can look at particular clubs do you think like that's a good starting point for people like because it's really important in betting that if you're trying to find an edge you try and stay as as niche as you can because you know if, if you take too much of an overall a basis of everything then it's going to be incredibly hard to find a like it's going to become a really general edge like would you would you recommend for people like coming up and maybe starting to like maybe start on a model on your your favorite team or maybe like even your favorite player or something like that <laughs> i think you probably d i wouldn't recommend that to be honest i mean i think what i'd recommend is you i mean and that's in fact going back to where we started with the world cup but i started thinking about these things you know i started with the premier league the world cup I, I started with things that understood so there's an argument for it in that case there's an argument if you understand messi very well you could build a messy betting model and if you under yeah i mean it's, it's yeah if you understand corners very well for example now i mean i yeah i i think it's not like picking a club it w might be picking some aspect so corners is a good one. I know quite a lot of people who, who work in the football industry. I know a couple of them who created corners models as a hobby, for example. Um, those, types of, those types of things. So yes, you could have a focused area in that way. Something reasonably simple you want to start with. The models I'm talking about now where you're actually going to do live betting and evaluating every action, that's probably at the top end of the most complicated uh, questions. So I would start with, with for example, um, a corners model is a nice one to do based on the style of play of the team. That's a kind of nice, nice idea. So yeah, definitely take a specialized thing that maybe people at the betting industry haven't looked at. But also don't, yeah, I, I don't know. Don't overestimate the skills of the um, the betting modelers, the people who work for the betting companies. I'm not sure all of them are really that motivated to find the most amazing models because the thing with the betting industry is there's loads of people just pouring on bets all of the time. That's why they make money. They make money by attracting people to their um, to their site and keep using their site to um, to place their bets. They don't actually need to have that sophisticated models to take money from these people, unfortunately. So don't overestimate the bookmakers. Think instead, you know, if I learn these basic skills of doing logistic regression, for example, or monitoring plus minuses in over and under markets, I can collect in data and then 
I can probably build a model which um, which takes money from the bookmakers because the bookmakers have an easy job. They just have to sit there waiting for people to place a lot of bets. And they focus mainly um, on advertising and getting in those bets rather than they actually focus on on adjusting the odds. I don't know, maybe Marius would disagree with me about this since you're up on a daily basis against these guys. But I, I, I don't think that they, uh, I don't rate them that highly. Uh, that's right, mate. We don't really rate them very high. <laughs> okay. so, I mean, we've been beating them for years. Um, <laughs> but um, one, one thing I wanted to add uh, to what you said, David, is that the bookmaker is not always necessarily trying to put out the most accurate odds either. They could be optimizing for a different metric, and most usually the exactly. metric they will be optimizing for is their overall profitability and their risk. And that might not be the same thing as the most accurate odds on the game, because if the bookmaker is getting 99% of the money in on Real Madrid uh, to win the game, then they, they will need to do some adjustments on the away odds in order to attract some more money on that to try and balance their books. Uh, so those sort of things can also happen and create opportunities. And I mean, all of these things are, are things that TradeMate kind of like indirectly picks up on. So, uh, yeah. What, are, what about COVID, David, like, or and even you, Marius, like if you guys had a look at some of the, the trends that have, happened since then because there's probably been a lot of variants or a lot of or maybe a lot of models that have been really challenged during during this time having no crowds having heightened schedules like david have you looked into any of this uh the yeah the I mean, I have having? in my in my role in hammerby that's been an important issue i mean we had a a not very good season and now you see it in the premier league as well like everyone was ruling out manchester city a bit ago then liverpool had a crisis and manchester united a top of surprisingly top of the table everyone thought chelsea was good at the start and i think a lot of the betting models go out the window uh, based on previous data when you look at those types of things and and you get that because i'm um, at hammerby i've actually you know I, I've been there in the, I haven't been there for the matches, but I've been in the training and there's a sort of different, I've been in the stadium quite a lot when there's just a training going on and it's a completely different atmosphere and you can hear it on the TV. I mean, last night it was 9-0, wasn't it, versus um, Manchester United, Manchester United, Southampton. Those results just don't occur in a normal season. I think we've had an 8-1 as well in various directions. They're, they're very unusual results. So a lot of them will be defying the models. Whether, I mean, I, I'm, you know, I have to be clear about all of this, this betting stuff. I mean, this is something I did because I was interested in together with Marius. I'm not involved at all in betting this season. And so I don't know if, if people have managed to sort of find the, the kind of edge over this new market. But um there's definitely a lot of different things happening than you'd expect. Uh, yeah, the away advantage disappeared, all of those types of things. Sorry, the home advantage I, disappeared. I think one can definitely like notice it in the games. Like Liverpool, for example, is a team when they're playing at home that are usually very, very fired up uh, by the crowd. Mm. And exactly. that can also be pretty intimidating for players who are not used to be playing in front of like 50,000 people mm. who are cheering on the home team and booing on you. Uh, so I, yeah. I think that that could be like a big reason behind why why teams such as uh, no. Aston Villa are, are having a good season beyond just having good players is that uh, the, the players can sort of, yeah. Yeah, not, so, not so we, had, it, we had exactly that, that problem. Sorry to interrupt, but we had exactly that problem at Hammerby because Hammerby have a regular... Um, 30,000 people come into their home matches. We hadn't been defeated at home for like two years. And then the teams we play against, some of them are quite small teams. They have 100 fans go and watch them. So they're totally used to this, like having 100 people or, or 20 people now in the stadium shouting. They don't feel in the least bit uncomfortable, but our players want to have 30,000 fans behind them. And so I think that's a that's a massive factor. And the fans really are a factor. It's very, it's very interesting, you know, you were... I think you can actually learn a lot. Uh, for a long time, everyone knows there's a home advantage. 
and the odds reflect that. But you can actually learn a lot about why there is a home advantage. So there was a theory that it was to do with traveling and it wasn't really to do with the fans. It was like staying in a hotel and not sleeping properly. But now you can very clearly see that the home advantage has a lot to do with fans because that's what's changed. You've got this is lovely for a scientist like me. You've got an experiment which works these things out. Yeah. Some positives coming from COVID, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is why this is the downside of being me is I don't really, yeah, you know, I see everything as an interesting experiment and an opportunity, and I don't really worry so much about the poor thirty thousand fans who don't get to go to the matches. Yeah, one one thing I've always been very curious on is uh, curious about is how do the individual players sort of react to. The analytics side are you are you like telling here uh, telling players that hey your shot locations now are terrible uh you should mm -hmm. move three meters closer before you start thinking about shooting and do, do are you telling the players these sort of insights and are are they taking them in or do they understand them or how does all that work yeah no they that's exactly right we we do exactly that type of thing that we have some uh, Certainly the shot location one is one that we dealt with very early when I started working at Hammer Bay. Um, and that's quite interesting because there was a lot of discussion. So I'd show these sort of zones where you have a higher chance of scoring. And there's a lot of discussion in particular by players who are who might play out on the wing and don't get into those central opportunities. Where should they shoot from? And it was interesting to talk to them because they could increase their shot chances from 1% up to 4% just by taking a couple more steps. And that was something they didn't clearly realize. But when they could see it and they looked at the data, they found it very convincing and useful. And um, football players are, well, football players at Hammerby, they're, they're clever and they understand things. They understand the game very well. They certainly understand the sort of spatial organization of the game and they can discuss these things and they're certainly willing to give feedback if they don't agree with something that we say to them. So no, that's worked out extremely well. All right, very, very cool to hear. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think I think it's a really uh, interesting topic you working with with Hammerby Football Club because it's you know mathematics and sport they don't that it like intuitively like when people you're you know your normal sports fan doesn't really while they're watching you know their favorite team play they're not really thinking about mathematics like when <laughs> when do you think this like cycle started to happen was there a year or a point in time where clubs started reaching out to someone like you or oh, this year has been really big for for that type of thing and i would say that i think it's probably is actually last season with the liverpool thing because they suddenly found that liverpool had this numbers guy ian graham working there and he was quite successful and influential in a few of the transfers that they made so that was one of the big steps towards people accepting this more that it's useful then you started to have expected goals on tv so it's actually i think that the the revolution in in football is just starting with um more people with an analytics background coming in yeah and how is the the business going the 12 bot business like are you are you looking at now like implementing it yourself into a betting realm or working with other people similar to what you did with Marius and Jan or are you more doing it, you know, from the perspective of working with clubs and stuff like that? So we, we work mainly with clubs. We work with the Swedish TV. Um, we actually do work with Svenska Spiel, which is the Swedish betting um, uh company but we don't work on this is why i say that we don't work on the predicting the odds side of things there we um make player radars for them and expected goals plots and those types of things so and then we work with a variety of, of different clubs and i also work together i have research projects together both with the england national team and with barcelona so i work on those different types of things and and with the work you're doing for Hammerby, and it's a similar question to what I said before with the introduction of XG and bookmakers using that in their models, is there is it is it is it like obviously teams have to use these analytic anal analytical side of things for their transfers and you know on the pitch and stuff like that, but mm. Is there much of like a, is it more so like you just have to do it to stay on like an even field or like 
is there like is there any kind of edge at all if you get what i mean like is there a way for you know teams to go beyond that like should they be because i i mean a team like oh, arsenal they, they um they just like completely obliterated their whole scouting network and um you know they've gone to a whole you know analyticals data analytical side of things like is there you know what i mean like if, if they're trying mm. to get an edge now is there like is there anything else that they can do on top of that no i mean the teams are a long way behind you know so arsenal arsenal are they've been doing it for a while and they've done very well in this um and uh, yeah, I don't know exactly the cost benefits of that. I mean, it's not quite going so well for them on the pitch. Liverpool are the they they've been extremely successful um, using this type of approach. Then everybody else is quite far behind. Barcelona do a lot, and I work together with them, but they do my, more on the research side of things. And um, no, they they do they do apply. That's not fair to say that Barcelona don't apply. But I mean, Barcelona use it as well. But there, and then I work with Benfica. And then there's the footballing federations. But then there's actually a, a massive gap there. Leicester are very good. Leicester have a very good data scientist. Um, I could sit there continue, but it's actually on two hands I can count up the top teams that really have. Uh, top level data scientists working for them who can who are doing this type of stuff on a regular basis i think uh, i'm a, maybe a bit biased here because <laughs> maybe i know the people that i know the people who are doing this but there's there's so much to be gained i know in fact i've talked directly to several extremely big teams who just have nothing in place of this type and so i believe that they can have an edge i mean but at the same time it's not like a proven there's not like a proven thing so if you take arsenal did it first right they started in 2012 it's not as if arsenal have won everything since they started doing analytics liverpool have been doing it for seven years and that has been successful for them so there's still a long way to go to prove that it works so even if you're if you're talking to these clubs the proof isn't quite there that it's really successful, um, but it's coming, and then they will start to have it. So no, there's, it's not like it's all there's a massive competition now that it's nearly solved, and uh, now you've got to work really hard to find an edge. Most of most clubs aren't doing the basic things that we talk about in the friends okay. tracking videos, for example. That's very has interesting. It been, has it been your impression that teams in, for example, like Sweden are more open to this sort of approach than in other countries because you always hear these stories about uh, like coaches making fun of the geeks sitting in the basement <laughs> with their laptops uh, yeah trying to figure out the game of football uh, that only proper football men can understand so uh, yeah. have you n noticed any like cultural differences there and and how easy it is for well, people to yeah, do this yeah i mean i think uh, and that's why i chose to work with Hammerby actually because well first of all I wanted to work with a local team and they're just very open to this type of stuff and gave me a lot of access to doing things I think there's a culture in the Premier League um, I mean first of all the players are paid such obscene amounts of money and the it's there's a sort of idea that the manager should control everything that it's very difficult to have a direct contact between analytics in the way that has been possible in Hammerby, for example, where we actually can talk on a daily basis about the statistics and we can show players clips and we can talk about, you know, what are the more optimal things to do. So I do think probably things are more open in that way. There's not the same, there's definitely not the same money, different type of system. Um, which is never going to have as much mm. money as it is in the Premier League clubs. So, yeah, there's benefits and um, risks in both cases. I mean, I didn't mention, when I mentioned this list, I didn't, of course, mention Brentford and Mithiland. I thought of them when you said yeah. Scandinavian clubs. And, of course, we know that they, they do a lot of this stuff. And there would probably be the biggest proof that, that it works done over a longer period of time but it's not that it's not that most premier league fans think of brentford as the massive success story but they're a success mm. story in terms of producing taking in players and producing players selling on players and just sort of gradually building something up and they will eventually get to the premier league yeah just uh, just wait and see they're they're gonna be there it's just a matter of time yeah. like uh 
I watched the uh, the game for Liverpool versus West Ham uh, the other day, and like Ben Rama, the latest West Ham signing, looks mm. so promising. He just had a couple of moves that were just extraordinary. Uh, so yeah. if you're able to find those sort of players on the cheap and develop them to become even better, and then sell them on for a big fee, money's going to accumulate, and yeah, you're going to end up with a good team eventually. They're they're going to have enough cash that they don't need to sell those players until they're in the Premier League. So. It's it's really interesting though, isn't it? Because the first, like maybe like the first, I could be wrong here, but the first time like analytics and using that in a sports environment was introduced was I would guess Moneyball mm. uh, in baseball, and I can't. Well, it was in the nineteen was it eighties or nineties? Oh, I can't, couldn't exactly tell you. But um, I think yeah, I think it was just sort of mid nineties. But the, the statistics have always been collected in baseball in a way that they've never been collected in football and and football's a more difficult problem in a way and i think that's what the that's what makes it interesting for someone like me because it, it requires more interesting mathematics okay um yeah. it's, it's not just uh, the the things there they could make some very easy gains just by looking at some basic stats on these players again the the scouts were evaluating them on how they walked and things like this and then some basic stats would show that yeah how they walked wasn't that relevant and that's also <laughs> something you hear in in football is like there's a lot of stuff about how the player sort of holds himself or something like that which is just totally irrelevant um to actually how they perform but yeah i think i think the um, that's that's the first play the money ball thing was the first really big application where they could make a big difference with um with using analytics yeah i guess the point i was trying to make is that was you know maybe let's just say 25 years ago it's just interesting mm. that uh football teams even when you know there's lots of proof out there that you can get an edge in in data analytics that uh big clubs um i'm happy for you to name a few that aren't doing it but <laughs> Um, like they, they're completely ignoring this, which is it's just fascinating that they would. Well, it isn't so it isn't they completely ignore it. So they're they're thinking about it, and the the point is that so one thing I told a a rather large Premier League club who came to visit me was that so my research on fish, um, I did a research on understanding fish movements, and we were breeding different types of fish, and we had to employ postdocs and PhD students to do this. It costs like. I think 2.5 million euros to do all of this work properly. And so that's the sort of budget that you need to give to somebody in order to really solve football. And that's the sort of budget that they looked at at Arsenal and Liverpool. But it's, and you say, all oh, right, it's nothing for these big clubs to make that sort of investment because they're paying um, 70 million for a striker or something, they can make that. But it doesn't quite work like that somehow. And the, the finances for football clubs are very interesting because although they have this massive sort of ins and outs of football players, it's all sort of plus minus to some degree. So 2.5 million is still quite a big investment um, for these types of clubs. And so it's really got to be seen, and, and that's 2.5 over five, five years, so we're thinking about like 500,000 pounds, 500,000 euros. It's still quite a lot of money, even for the biggest clubs, and they're realizing it, but they've just got to come over that, you know, now we really need to, to go for it. Yeah. All right, mate, we'll try and wrap this up for you because mm. you're, uh, you're a busy man and we've been talking for a long time already. So I've got a few more questions left for you. I think it's like it would be quite fitting if we could uh, just briefly touch on your latest book, 10 mm. Equations That Rule the World. I'll just get that, uh, that photo up on the screen for everyone to look at. So there's the cover. I don't know if that's the cover of the book or at least very close to it. Um, from your from your PowerPoint <laughs> slides, you sent across. It's it's a little bit different from Socomatics, and obviously there's a chapter in there where you discuss your uh, relationship with Jan and Marius and what you guys got up to. But yeah, mm. can you briefly just give us a yeah synopsis of what the book's about? Yes, yeah, so I've I've got into that a, a little bit during this conversation. Is I mean, it really came down to this idea that mathematicians have this small edge over everybody else in the world and that might be in betting it might be in finance it might be in social media and that small edge allows them to be well i say, I say it's not only 
not only like richer than everybody else, but it also makes you a little bit happier. So I have a lot of self-help advice in there about how you can reason about different problems. And we were talking about this before we came on. I have this example with using Bayes' theorem. This is the judgment equation in the book. It's how to think about when somebody lets you down. You know, so if Marius tomorrow, he lets you down and he tells you that, that you know, this, this whole podcast you did today was like, crock of shit and he didn't like it like how should you judge it you know so you, every day mate <laughs> yeah okay <laughs> if it, and that's the point if it's every day then yeah you should maybe draw some conclusion but if it's just one time occurrence then 95 percent of the time marius is nice and five percent of the time he yeah he well you, you, you what what you can do in the book and i go through this in the book is you can use Bayes' equation and these types of equations in order to make judgments. And often you conclude, the conclusion, of course, is that Marius is a nice guy, you know, that normally people can let you down, even nice people make mistakes, and you need to put that into your equation to work out what to do. And so I have both the, I describe in the book, both the workings of what I call 10, which is this organization a sort of secret conspiracy theory of mathematicians who are controlling the world. Plus, I give you some sort, of, sort of everyday tips about how you can make your own life better by using these types of um, this type of approach. So it's a sort of combination with, between this um, mystery of uh, the 10 organization plus some very nice tips on, on how to be a better person. Yeah, one of my favorite things that you mentioned in the in the Ox, I think it was the Oxford University PowerPoint presentation mm. that you did was um, like your relationship with your kids, and that you're better off. Like the the effect that you can have in your your child's life is more positive if you tell them to get more sleep and and eat their breakfast rather than telling them to get off get off their phone. Maybe you can briefly explain that because I thought that's just a really a really easy way to digest like the mathematical side of things and the effect it can have on people's lives. Yeah, so that's exactly related to this judgment equation idea as well, that um, what you can look at is the effect. So over, I, I looked at the relationship between depression and mobile phone usage, and there is a relationship there. If you use your mobile phone too much as a teenager, if you use it for more than seven hours a day, you tend to be a bit more, I'm indicating you're a bit more d depressed overall. But when you look at this, and so you see the headlines about this in the newspapers, like depressed teenagers. But what I did is I looked at the research study and I compared it to other things that make teenagers depressed. And it turns out on a scale of one to 100, there's a one point decrease in your happiness if you use your mobile phone seven hours a day. But if you don't get a good night's sleep, there's a three point decrease. If you don't eat breakfast, there's a three point decrease. So I stopped like nagging my kids about using their mobile phones as much. And I focused on like these things that are actually important, you know, eating your breakfast, um, going to bed. So going to bed, of course, without your mobile phone, that's the <laughs> kind of key there. You can't have it both ways. You can't have a good night's sleep and be looking at your mobile phone all night. So there is a correlation there, but you'd focus on these types of things. And I wouldn't say, I mean, I, you know, it's always difficult this that uh, i'm i'm a real dad to kids and i don't know that i mean they think that i'm a great dad i suppose but i wouldn't go around saying i'm an amazing dad or something like this but what i do try to do is use rational um mathematical decision making in these types of everyday situations and also spend a lot of time in the book thinking about um the difference between objective and subjectivity so you can be very subjective in what you like and what you do but you can also put that to objective way. And a lot of that sort of comes out, I think, in the, the 10 equation of mathematics. It's not this hard calculating money ball. You know, it's not that like I fire my kids if they don't perform up to a certain level or something like that. <laughs> it's the soft side of using mathematics um, to be a better person. Yeah, no, it's really interesting stuff. And I assume, yeah, maybe you can just let everyone know where they can find uh, your book or maybe the better ways to find your book other than places like Amazon. I think I saw <laughs> that you're promoting that on your Twitter. <laughs> yeah, I, I put up this, this. If you're in the UK, I put up a thing on my Twitter there that you can look get it from a local bookshop. It's actually not out in the US. 
So if you've got US people there, it's coming out in the US in June. Uh, it's out in Swedish. So it just came out in Swedish. Um, uh, so you can see it then. And of course, it's out in English in the UK. Yeah, it's available at all good bookstores, uh, plus <laughs> Amazon, of course. <laughs> And I've got I've got two more like betting related questions for you. And I, I on the Pinnacle podcast, I found it really interesting. It was kind of what we were talking about before with the the people are looking for that quick tip and that like you know get rich quick kind of solution. And you were saying that there's so many like academic papers out there talking about successful sports betting strategies. And I think you mentioned one before. And um, I don't know if, but I, I remember uh, doing some research on Bill Benzer and how he, um, you know, he kind of formulated a lot of his horse racing strategy around reading academic papers. And you, you were saying mm. how, you know, people just completely ignore these papers because they want mm. that, you know, that get rich quick solution. Can you name, maybe name a few of these papers that have really helped you and, um, you know, the out, kind of ones that are outside like a what a, I guess, a standard betting blog or a uh, like, a, you know, a, a standard website where like, I guess, like the trade mate blog where we're just talking about the, you know, you know, what value betting is and what variance is and closing lines and all this kind of stuff. Are, are these papers going beyond that? Um, yeah, I think, I mean, the Bentner paper is a very good starting point um for that type of thing and i think i'd give this tip in a slightly different way because i think it can be a bit disappointing to just sit down and read one or two of these these papers as a starting point what i actually do when i'm trying to learn about a subject is i will take that paper for example look it up on google scholar so not on the normal google google search results are getting worse and worse if you go onto google scholar and you search for the bentner paper um, and then I think that's 96. And then you look at what papers have cited that paper and that are more recent, see if a title catches your attention there and start reading that one. If it doesn't work out for you, try a different one. And I think that's the way to do it is to sort of browse around like you would browse the internet, like you would sit there on, instead of spend an evening on YouTube, spend an evening on Google Scholar browsing papers, download a few, read a few of them, read a bit, just try and get a feeling for the different types of things that people write and the way they write it. Often, if you look at review papers, they might give you the answers that you're looking for about different methods and then start to collect in the terms. And then you can put in the, in. if you look at the terms that people are writing in these papers, you can also search for them and you'll also find things related to that. So it's really to browse in the normal way instead of browsing youtube this evening browse uh google scholar and find things that interest you awesome advice mate and to finish up i think it would be fitting to finish in kind of this way because you've you've done so many and it's, it's a similar question that i ask uh basically every guest we have on the podcast like a general like if you could give one advice to a sports better on how they can improve what would it be but i think maybe it might be more fitting if you kind of could give like a more general life advice maybe because because you've you know you've worked in so many different uh industries and you've done so many different things like maybe just like a a really general kind of advice for people on how they can improve you know not only in their betting but you know in their general life sense i'm not not trying to make you some kind of life coach but i think because yeah. you've been like you've been doing so many different things that it could be useful yeah it's it's, I'm getting asked this question more and more, and I, I should be able to have better answers for this this thing, and I should be able to have these kind of inspiration. Sorry, you've just cut out a little bit. Yeah, you disappeared just as I was about to give you the most important advice of your life. <laughs> I cut out. For me, who's always been a very analytical person, and I, I mentioned this stuff to do with my kids and dealing with those types of situations, it's to let the sort of soft side and the emotional side of what you do into the analytical side of what you do i think that's a is a very difficult thing to get the balance right and i think if you're just working on a job then you should just maybe do the analytical bit but in your private life it's allowing yourself to have these sort of dreams and these strange ideas and to let them sort of intertwirl with the more rational thinking and i think that's where the best ideas come from that so that that's my advice is to allow your rationality and all of that analytical thinking you have 
to sort of combine with the kind of wild, strange dreams you have. No, that's it's terrific advice, mate. Um, and yeah, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Thank you to you, Marius, for coming back on and explaining some of the stuff you've you've done with David. Um, where's the best place people can find you, David, if they want to get in touch with you or, yeah, maybe a chance for you to talk about some of your new projects on the horizon? Yeah, that's definitely uh, Socomatics on Twitter. If you at me there, I go into Twitter every day and and check that out. So uh, please, please uh, at me on Twitter if you want to want to know more. (laughs) Awesome, mate. I'm sure you have a few people getting in touch because, yeah, there's so many different facets of life that you're covering or that you've covered throughout your uh, throughout your time, mate. So brilliant yeah. stuff. And thanks. Thanks, everyone, for listening. Sorry, did you want to say something else? No, no, I was just saying thank you. No, that's really oh. that's <laughs> nice. <laughs> it's been really nice, nice uh, catching up and uh, meeting you. So thanks a lot. No, anytime, mate. Um, and yeah, thanks for listening, everyone. Hope you hopefully you've enjoyed today's podcast. Please make sure you do a quick rate and review of the podcast and subscribe to us. It would be very, very greatly appreciated so we can get more fantastic guests on like David. And if you're looking to implement some of the strategies, I know we kind of went around a, a big merry-go-round today and talked about lots of things, but if you're interested in value betting and you want to implement some of those strategies then start a free week trial of trade mate sports gentlemen fantastic stuff and we'll have to catch up soon okay thank you bye-bye yeah